talk about what was the complex linear combination of uh, <laughs> 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 uh, the uh, it, was, it was really hard. It's actually, for me, being on a panel like this shows me that I'm getting old. Um, because I have to give advice to uh, junior people. Uh, um, I want to talk about one thing today that I think is uh, often uh, forgotten, and I think it's a, a, a often a weakness uh, uh, among PhD students and junior faculty alike. Um, uh, we talk all about uh, you know how to get published, um, you know what topics to pick, and so. But what I find very often when teaching PhD classes, when looking at junior faculty struggling uh, to determine what they want to do in their career. Um, it's uh, often uh, because of a lack of critical uh, thinking. Okay? If I look back on my career, I'm old. I got my PhD in 1960, before many of you were born. Um, <coughs> and uh, look at my CV, how did I get there? I think one of the important things is that um, um, you know I read a lot. And thought a lot, spoke a lot to people about this, and I want to say a little bit about this, and I will give you some examples because I want to get this point across. It's extremely important in shaping your research agenda, what you're going to do, and your success, and eventually your impact. Nobody here talked about impact yet. It looks like the only thing that's important is publishing one of the eight journals. I'm learning the finance jargon, eight journals. I'm new to business schools. Been now for two years in a real business school. Um, so, <laughs> all right. So, um, and looking back as to what I uh, did myself, um, um, you know, critical thinking is important. Uh, Stanford Business School has a critical thinking uh, program uh, course for their uh, students. And one day, Jonathan Burke, uh, the notorious or infamous Jonathan Burke, that he was asked to teach it, and he told me that he basically would give a paper to the students to read and comment on it. And if you just looked at the results of these comments, virtually everybody liked the paper. For the mere fact that John had given the paper to them. Rather than say, okay, we have this paper, what do I think about this? Right. And this is extremely important. So this is the only thing I want to say, but I want to really drive this home because I see this very often uh, among students, uh, during faculty, that it's just they're not thinking critically enough. And so what is really going on? Well, by the way, this is my uh, my my uh, life sphere. Um, so <coughs> I was looking at this. I had to do this for for uh, for some grant proposal, big grant proposal. This is the areas where I've worked in, right? And uh, there are some things that you may never have heard. Like there was a lot of prefrontal cortex, or GABA, or something like that, or MDL learning, or something like that. And how did I get there? I mean, um, it is really reading and talking. All right, so that's, uh, um, you, can, you can get a slide later if you want to see, you know, explore my world. There are certain things missing there, like football, as I mentioned, right? <laughs> uh, I, I just don't know much about football and baseball, so over beers, I do have a problem often. Right? Uh, you want me to talk about, you know, if you want, uh, about machine learning or patient learning or so, right? I'm good with baseball, is problem not. All right, so the important thing, as I said, is read, read, read. And let me quote uh, William Faulkner. Read everything. Trash, classics, good and bad. Just pick up the journal of finance. Read everything. There's a lot of trash in it. There's a lot of very good things in there, and there are classics in there. Right? Um, and read the original papers. Right? Don't just stick to a textbook. Just go back to the original papers, because there are lots of I'll quote Merton in a minute. Right? Classical paper, 1973. And you'll see the quote is actually extremely misleading. Right? Even at the time of 1973. Right? And how do I know this? Because you know, I read what happened before murder. So the question, you'll have to question. First, what did one know before a given paper was written? This is extremely important if you understand, want to understand classical papers. Michael like talked about classical papers, right? What was the author intending to show? Very often that's different from what we now perceive the paper to be about. Is there a contradiction with other papers or with another paper? Right? And if confused, just ask. Talk, talk, talk. Talk to your peers and talk to very good teachers. So I'll give you a little anecdote. So, as some of you know, I uh, dabbled in neuroscience 
and I have incredibly good teachers, among, among them is Wolfgang Schultz at Cambridge University, and we have a deal. He teaches me neuroscience and teaches me decision theory in KT. Right? It's been uh, like that for about 12 years or 13 years now. One day, I just asked him about, about dopamine. Um, if you don't know what dopamine is, go get a coffee or take some cocaine. Right? <laughs> um, so the story about cocaine, uh, about cocaine, okay, about <laughs> dopamine is that actually it's the reward center of the brain and, and it gives you this arousal feeling. So one day, you know, I am in a pub in Cambridge with um, with Schultz. We do everything over here. Uh, and um, it, so he, uh, uh, I, I asked him, so what's this whole story about arousal and, and the rewards uh, of the brain? Uh, this this dopamine story, uh, and it's also all rubbish. Uh, and he should not. Uh, he's Mr. Dopamine in, in the world. So and I was flabbergasted because you open up any neuroscience textbook in the time. Right? So there's no evidence that it's true. In fact, that's not exactly true. Uh, six months ago, a paper was published in the Journal of Neuroscience showing that in one specific effect, uh, uh, instance, dopamine in neurons can actually cause arousal. Right? So, so uh, talk to very good, find yourself very good teachers. One of my teachers was the late Richard Green, who passed away um, this week. Uh, he was a former editor of General Finance. He was my first mentor when I, like you, became an assistant professor at Carnegie Mellon University. I learned a lot from him. He showed me how to prove the gap in Hilbert space. Right? Very useful. <coughs> my PhD students know what. All right, so uh, actually let me go outside finance because I'm going to make a point here. Just go back to, well, this is what, what I show my students who are teach them about experiments, right? But it, 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 you can use this too for other uh, purposes as well. You know, Galileo, one of the things that he showed is what gravity is really about. Right? What did people know before he did the same experiments with, you know, throwing balls at, uh, at the floor? Um, it was an Aristotelian idea. Heavier objects um, fall faster, right? Um, what did Galileo propose? No, that's not true. Right? Objects uh, of different weights, they fall at the same speed. And the story is that he threw two stones from the Tower of Pisa. This is a story. The truth is that it actually used incline. This is the small paintings. And the interesting thing about this is that even nowadays when you go and talk to people, you know, they may know this, but they think it's obviously wrong. Right? So uh, a couple of weeks ago, I had a discussion with somebody on a uh, US bobsled team who claimed that women bobsleds are slower, right? Because women don't weigh as much, right? And actually, I had experience with the Utah uh, um, um, Olympic car, uh, Park, close to where I live, in Park City, um, and was looking there. And there's this bobsled with four Germans in it from Gussie, Germans, right? Big, bulky, right? <laughs> and then after that, there were two tiny uh, girls, women, um, and they arrived down there at exactly the same moment, right? There was no effect of their differential weight. It was all a little skill up march, right? Now, if, let's imagine that this is still true, that actually, you know, well, you know, you can say whatever you want, however, in practice, this is not relevant. What do we do then? Right? And this is where you, the critical thinking really comes in. We can construct a theory, we can actually just throw away um, Galileo's theory because it's not relevant for the, three, uh, the, the real world, even in ideal situations like Bob Slice, right? It's hardly any friction on the ice. If you've ever been on that ice, you don't, can't stand up. So what we can do is we can actually just throw out the, uh, the uh, Galileo theory and, and construct a theory that allows for object-specific speech, like it is a theory of a male Bob Slice. Right? Or let's do finance, you know? It sounds a bit like a classic price goal, right? Cap M is wrong, right? Uh, so let's just act factors until we by mathematical necessity will find enough of the factors to finally explain it. We know that there will be enough factors at one point we'll, we'll, we'll find it, right? Um, is that what we want to do? Is that what we are aiming uh, for? By the way, the Capem holds in the lab. Actually, it works incredibly well. Just like the real stuff works very well on the moon. Right? Does that mean it's irrelevant for us? Because it works on the moon, not on Earth. No, it's not true. Right? Sounds a little bit like behavioral finance. Well, I'm actually critical of behavioral finance uh, myself here. Right? 
Um, let's choose a convenient reference point for every occasion. Okay? Uh, that's not necessarily going to be a very good approach to advancing uh, uh, science. Okay? So uh, we are struggling with this. Right? We're here. finding this struggling with, you see, you know, classical findings, linear asset pricing theory is struggling with this. Well, they just look at the path factors. Right? Throwing out uh, a theory that is perfectly valid and, and, in, in, and replacing it with something that actually is uh, a uh, is not a certain good idea. Here's another example. Fire and efficient market hypothesis. It's all about critical thinking. How did we get to the efficient market hypothesis? And this is pretty amazing, right? So if, uh, uh, when, when people laugh at efficient market hypothesis now, but I think it is just remarkable what happened. What did people know when pharma in the mid-60s started saying, no, we should actually just change the way we think about finance? Namely, that prices were set by demand and supply, and economists would tell you that. Or, you know, the Gordon Grove model, if you were uh, uh, mostly into finance. And in both cases, if one of the parameters is expected to change, the prices will be expected to change too. Right? So if tomorrow there's going to be a change in the demand of oil, we expect tomorrow the oil price to go up or down. Um, what did Farmer propose? Price change was not really predictable. He said something else, but that's the bottom line of it. Prices, you know, if they were predictable, then you know you would take advantage of it right now. Incidentally, this has been a logic Bachelier. I composed this in 1900 in a beautiful piece. It's in French, um, but it's still nevertheless beautiful because this is actually a mathematical milestone. He defined the ground of motion in 1900, 20 years before Wiener and. Uh, using stock prices, and he had proposed that theory. Sam also proved formally what Farmer was saying in the mid-60s using something actually that was known from probability from 1948, a famous paper that he published, the fact that Bayesian beliefs have to be Martin Gills. Right? Martin Gills are just stuff that's not predictable, at least on the first uh, moment. But you know, just like with what Galileo's case, the efficient market hypothesis is obviously wrong. Right? So let me just give you a plot. I don't have to do very much, but you know, I just you can show you the standard force composite from 1940 to 1980. You can extend this, and you can see it goes up and down, up and down, up and down. And these, you know, these going up and down, they're actually there. There's, this is not um, uh, because I stared at this uh, picture long enough. The gray bands here actually that uh, have some meaning that I'm not going to talk about. Right, so it goes up and down, and of course, if you do good statistical analysis, you will actually find the inversion. Should you then throw out the efficient market hypothesis? Um, not necessarily so. Right? It's clear there are cycles in stock prices. Uh, the easiest way to actually get out of it's all about it looks like the moon swings in the stock market. But that sounds like a very cheap way of explaining things. I think we should take final stuff much more seriously. But is it really right? And so this is an interesting episode in the 70s. So when uh, the ball was back in the camp of the economist who had, you know, cooked up this theory about demand and supply, the economist took the challenge and said, you know, does this make sense? We found the proposals and what uh, Sam also was uh, proposing. And economists, of course, you know, they think in terms of equilibrium, general equilibrium, uh, demand and supply of, for all markets at the same time. Again, we want to be critical about this. Okay. Um, do you really believe that markets equilibrate? Actually, even ask yourself a question. Do we have, in economics, um, a good reason to believe that markets uh, uh, equilibrate? The textbook case for this is that, well, if the prices are too high, there's going to be excess supply, and hence, the price is going to go down. If the, pri if the prices are too low, then there's too excess demand, and the price is going to go up. So prices go in the direction of excess demand. Right? And that's the story. That's the valuation, that's the law, as we call that. And that's supposedly the, the justification of why markets are good. We know from the 60s that this won't work. And we have actually experimental evidence that shows that it actually does not work like that at all. We don't have, unlike the physicists, a good reason to believe that markets are good. Phys physicists have the law of entropy. Right? And it tells OK, but the first stage we can actually focus on the good. The economists have nothing like that. I was 23 years at a, at a faculty at Caltech, surrounded by people who asked me, OK, guys, tell me something about, tell us something about economics. And so I start talking about equilibrium. And the first question they ask is, what's equilibrium? And why are you interested in that? 
Right? Do we have any reason to believe that? And I have to admit, well, I don't have any reason to believe it. Right? That's problematic for us. Extremely problematic. It's also important when you guys empiricists to go to the stock market and pretend that every price you see is an equilibrium price. If you have no good reason to believe it. But no, no, let's just imagine it works. Right? We actually have lots of experimental evidence that it works. Right? Vernon Smith, Charlie Plot, and all those guys. Don't let your don't plot figure the I'll take. They all show this. Experiment after experiment after experiment. So we'll believe that we're in equilibrium. We're not going to have to be able to, we're not going to be able to use the Laurentian equilibrium. Why not? Because Laurentian equilibrium just takes prices as given, yet in a financial market, we're talking about prices in the future that we haven't seen yet. So you have to form expectations because in the long period world, you have to worry about continuation prices. So that's where in the 60s, economists had already thinking, been thinking about how we're going to solve this problem. Booth has a famous paper in America. Green has a working paper that is still floating around, never published. And Roy Rock in Econometica, showing actually the following, extending the notion of equilibrium from all raising equilibrium to the equilibrium, the notion that you, knew, that you use in every dynamic asset pricing model. It's called rational expectations. It's actually a misnomer. Really, it's better to call it perfect foresight. Given a future state, the investors know what prices will be. Somebody with rational, uh, with a perfect foresight, behaves like this guy here. He has an umbrella and a shotgun. <laughs> right? Why? Because he knows there's several states in the world in the future. One is that it rains, he better have an umbrella for that case. The other is that there could be some terrorist attack, and so you want to shoot the terrorist. Right? So that's perfect foresight. He doesn't know what the chance is that it's going to rain or that terrorist occurs, that terrorism will occur, but at least he's prepared for this. And this is what perfect foresight is about. Um, do we use a finance case? You should know that the Ben and Jerry stocks price will be high in a hot summer. Which is actually not true because Ben and Jerry is a privately held company. But anyway. um, <laughs> we don't need to know how likely it is that the summer will be hot. So here come, comes it now, Lucas. 1978 paper. This is the reason why that paper was written. We now know that paper from the uh, sarcastic quality approaches, but the real reason why it was written is section 8. Right? So what did he show? First, he actually goes in, it makes it easy, station economy, right? Station is like static economy. This is actually a very station time series. This is EEG, by the way. This is brain signals. Very station, economy station. And he imagines the economy is like that as well. Question that he asks himself is, first two questions, will the CAPM still hold? You know, the CAPM is a one period ball. And you have payoffs in the future. And if the payoff, the bad of the payoffs are positive, then the expected return is going to be uh, above the risk of rate. But now we have a multi period economy. It's not obvious that if the payoffs, the dividends are positively correlated with the dividends of the market, that the prices will be positively correlated because the prices are equilibrium prices of continuation. So that the return in total will have a positive value. He shows the answer is yes. Then he actually asks, will prices be predictable? And the answer is absolutely yes. You can have an incredible amount of predictability in equilibrium. So here's a quote from his paper. So Lucas, from commenting on the market of property, that's what section 8 is called, no, my, my uh, contribution to the market of property, it is clear the presence of a diminishing marginal rate of substitution of future for current consumption is inconsistent with this property. Let me say this in French. You finance guys are full of BS mm -hmm. with the market of uh, property. Right? Um, I think this is extremely important for us to actually think about uh, markets. And by the way, Experiments prove Lucas right. Um, Elena and I, we actually asked for a while, and I, we just published something in Journal of Finance about this. But let me just show you this is a class experiment that she ran actually a couple of weeks ago uh, at the University of Utah. And this is an economy in which the state could be either high, as the, the, uh, this is a period with a high state, the green block is high. If it's low, that means it's a low state, high, low, low. And Lucas would predict that if the states are high prices, are high states are low prices are low. And you can go to see it's actually from. People here know there are only two possible cases. Either the economy stays high or goes low. If it stays high, prices stay the same. If it goes, they know prices are going to go and are on average dropping. Right? And yet they don't do anything about this. Right? Uh, because they can't. That's an equilibrium phenomenon. Uh, there are also two assets there, by the way. There's a blue asset and a, and a red asset. The blue asset has a low beta, and the red asset has a high beta. Uh, and as you can see, 
the blue acid is more expensive than the red acid. So the blue acid is red. Here's a fourth case. I, I just want to show you these cases uh, to, about critical thinking. This is a pretty remarkable one. How many of you have heard of a guy named Jacques Trez? Oh, come on, this is a shame. Good. Good, thank you, Mike. <laughs> he is a, when I got into finance, I, I, I actually was, uh, my, my, uh, my aspiration was to, to become a PhD in probability and statistics. And uh, I, had, uh, I was in Brussels then, in Belgium, and I had uh, the occasion to actually see Mr. Uh, Professor Trez. And uh, one of his famous papers is something that's published in the you know, European Economic Review in 1970, and let me quote from this. It is shown in this paper that prices for contingent claims have all the formal properties of a probability measure on the states, i.e., he was the first to prove that prices are, can, you can use prices to construct an equivalent of market yield measurement. 1970, when was Black Schultz published? Come on, I guess. 1972. Great. Three. And Merton's paper, and he said, I will quote uh, Merton in a second. What does equivalent market yield measure mean? I actually am focusing on equivalent. Zero probability events at zero state price probability and vice versa. Something that can't happen in reality will have a zero price and vice versa. And that's the only link between prices and probabilities. The only link. That's a very poor link. Something that has probability one third of happening can have any price between zero and one. Not zero and not one included, right? But everything else goes. So there is hardly any relation between the physical probabilities and state price probability. Or you may call this a discretion measure, right? Come, Black, Schultz, and Merton. This is a quote from Merton's paper. This is the one in the, uh, the rational option pricing. It was in the Bell Journal of the Economics. Page 161, he writes, the manifest characteristic of the Black-Scholes formula is the number of variables that he does not depend on, such as the expected position on the stock. Actually, and we all teach at our students, this is an exception. What's remarkable is that one can use the true physical volatility to price the option. Because Dress, three years before that, has shown there is no relationship between the two. So the fact that he can use physical probabilities to say something about um, uh, prices of options prices, about the pricing measure, is pretty remarkable. Analogously, right, in the same paper, what Merton does is actually use the heat equation to, uh, um, to actually solve what it could. So very often you actually, you know, if you hear the statement, the black soul equation is the heat equation of physics. That is absolutely not useful, right? Diffusion of, a, of heat in a rod, um, a steel rod, does not give you any intuition about stock prices and option prices. The following is inside the Black Scholes equation is the Komogorov Fokker Planck equation for a mark of transition that's in continuous time. Why is that? Because prices are probabilities. So they have to satisfy everything probabilities have to satisfy. In a mark of world, like in the Black Scholes world, it better satisfy that equation. If you've never seen that equation, here is a French version of this. Uh, this is online, actually. This is actually a little video you can watch on YouTube. A French guy from Apple Polytechnic or something like that showing you how this works. And you can see, this is the proof. And you can see the black shoulder equation. The second order term, this is the first order the, uh, the term. And this is the stuff that drops out that's equal to zero. Right? That's exactly what it is. If Black and Scholes had found any other equation, they could have rejected the big by saying this can't possibly be true, knowing what it is. Last case is my own case. I just want to get you out of your comfort zone of finance, right? Uh, psychology theory month. Um, three minutes. Uh, what is theory of money? It's the capacity to read, to read intention <coughs> of This is a phenomenon that psychology has been studying since about uh, 1940. Okay. Um, and uh, so here is a little cartoon that actually explains what it is. Theory of money is about what this guy is doing. I know what you're thinking. Terrible things about me. Well, screw you, and excuse my French, um, and your judgments. And this little fellow who is actually not thinking about him, he's thinking about pie. Um, so this guy has a really terrible theory of mind. Across the human population, yeah, there are people very good at this, and there are people very bad at this. Uh, I end up being on the bad side. Uh, 
that does not keep me from studying this. Um, so, because you know, I still have the hope one day I will learn it. Um, so, what is theory of mind? It's capacity to read intentions of others. Now, there's a lot known about this. Uh, in particular, there's even known what brain structures are involved in this. I, I just could not keep myself from putting a brain picture on that. All right. So this is a picture of the brain. Uh, this is the cortex actually you see only. And uh, this is the front and this is the back. Your visual cortex is there. This is supposed to be executive function in there. It turns out that your social cognition is done there in the back. It's the temporal parietal junction here. Both sides, right? And uh, uh, lateral, that actually does your social cognition. And that's, if you, if you kill off that part of the brain, you will become like the guy on the car in the cartoon here. You just no ability to figure out what other people are thinking. Um, the other part of the brain is the dorsal and prefrontal cortex. Uh, this is a bad, you know, this should be a cross-sectional brain right in the middle, right? And it's there. It's also called the single cortex. They used to do lobectomy, that's what it's called, right? And they just would, you know, when it hurts, take it away. Because when they did that, they saw the patients would still stand up and walk out of the, uh, out of the hospital, right? And do everything they could, read, write, they could do exams, they could drive, they could do everything, they could pay taxes. But they took away their social cognition. Okay? Um, so these two parts of the brain are involved in it. And when we started studying theory of mind in neuroscience, we were thinking about, oh fine, this is okay, you know, this is what if you cut out those pieces of the brain, people don't have theory of mind anymore. But what are these brain parts doing? Right? So that's what we're interested in. We wanted to understand what these regions are computing. So we sat down, and this is actually just, this is literally in a PhD class. I had half the neuroscience program, the digital neuroscience program called Tech in my uh, group, and I was teaching finance. Of course, you can see that I was a little bit off there. They were asking, why is it important to know the intentions of others? Why is it hard to just think through the issues and figure out without doubt that what other person is doing? Think about this, something that you know about theory, about something that actually you weren't <laughs> at school. Well, it's game theory. And there's one aspect of game theory, it's mixed strategies. That's when you actually have a hard time figuring out what the other guy is doing. If you're a strategist, you figure out immediately what the other guy is doing. You don't even have to think about what the other guy is thinking, you just have to respond. Right? So games with mixed strategies, we do. Like for instance, this is a, a, a matching pace game with asymmetric uh, uh, payoffs. Um, where you have to mix, not by flipping a coin, but you have to have a biased and what we found is actually when we played this, let the subjects play this game in a scanner, that we found exactly what those parts of the brain were controlling. <laughs> Namely, the prediction, the prediction of the effect of your own action on the opponent's beliefs, and uh, of course also the prediction error. The prediction error is in the temporal junction, and the prediction is in the prior pricing of the vortex. Interested in it? This is published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences in 2008. So this is basically what I would say, you know, this, how did we get to this point? Right, this is actually, this paper is used in psychiatry nowadays. Because, of course, you know, there's a lot of mental disorders that have a lot to do with uh, bad social cognition. Uh, the task is used out there to actually identify uh, disorders. When you let schizophrenics play this game, first they don't go to it right, and second, actually, there's a lot of interesting stuff that happens in the brain that actually doesn't happen. Um, last thing I want to say is, you know, you talk to people, right? Talk to your peers. I, I just don't understand it. I'm confused. Don't explain it, right? Or talk to, you know, talk to them. When you go to the cocktail party and you have a question, you know, go to one of the big shops and ask him, so how do you, how do, you do this? How, how, what's the fifth factor in the form of French uh, thing? I don't understand it, right? That's all I wanted to say. Critical thinking is extremely important to our team. Uh, you know, building for you. Thank you, Peter.